Welcome back, everybody. This is uh, Creation Liberty Hour, um, show number 18. I had to figure out which one it was. Uh, for December 12th, 2011, my name's Chris Johnson. I'm the founder of Creation Liberty Evangelism, where our purpose is to win the lost to Christ and to teach the truth of science and God's Word. And just so you all know, I mean, the reason I state this every single show is because I want people to know my position. Usually people get so angry just because I tell them what I believe uh, it's it's ridiculous how angry they get, but I just want you guys to know where I'm coming from, so you don't have to question it. I believe, without apology, that evolution is the most dumbest, the most dumbest. <laughs> that was brilliant. The dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of mankind. I don't think there's ever been a dumber or more dangerous religion ever. Uh, and if you're watching this for the first time, or if you're watching a live recording from YouTube, you can always join us in live chat. Uh, and that would be at creationliberty.com. You just click on podcast every Monday. At uh, 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, we uh, start the show there, and you can join us in live chat. We'll discuss your comments. We'll discuss your questions, uh, whether you're a creationist or evolutionist, so everybody's welcome. And we always open that chat up at 6.30, so you can chat with us a little bit before we get started. So, uh, anyway, today's show, let me see here. Uh, I'm checking to make sure I opened up everything this time, because sometimes I don't. Yeah, so today's show, uh, last week I had some people ask about... Um, what was it? Cavemen. That's right, you know, they were asking about Neanderthals or, or basically the ape to man evolution model, that, you know, the typical one that you see if, you know, if you look up the word evolution on, uh, you know, like uh, Google Images or something like that, you'll see the, you know, monkey to man model that they always show. And uh, so we're going to discuss a little bit of that today and I've, I've opened up some slides that we're going to use. So let me go ahead and pull those up now. And uh, we will discuss that issue. So, um, Basically, you know, this is a National Geographic, what you're looking at here. Uh, it talks about the first pioneer, a new find shakes the human family tree. You know, every time they always say, oh, we found this, this new skull that links, you know, humans and monkeys together. Uh, and the question is, you know, because they're always, you know, I make the joke, you know, somebody's trying to make a monkey out of you. But I always ask the question in my seminars, I say, is it possible for an ape to turn into a human? And you can, uh, you know... If you want to insert Bill, you know Bill Clinton, uh, that definitely would be true, but uh, <laughs> or might be true. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the thing is, uh, if you want to put, you know, somebody wants to make one of these for, you know, Osama bin Laden or George Bush or any of our last few presidents would probably work here. So uh, you can go ahead and make me one of those, and I'll be happy to put it in my seminar. Uh, but in Genesis one twenty eight, uh, God said, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness." Okay, so we are made in the image of God. Now, you know, a lot of people, especially the, um, you have some of the old earth creationists and things like that, you know, well, what, what was, what's the image of God? Is it a monkey? Is it a fish? Is it an amoeba? What is it? And they really have, I mean, I've never really heard a definitive answer to that question. I mean, they want to claim that man, you know, is, you know, was made in the image of God, but then they would have to include the rest of their theory on top of that, and it becomes a difficult uh, thing for them to compromise. Um, difficult, <laughs> nothing, impossible. But we're going to take a trip down uh, what we call evolution's hall of shame. And there's been a whole lot of uh, hoaxes and frauds that have been made trying to make uh, man and monkey have an evolutionary link, okay? And we'll just cover a few of those. The p first one's going to be the Piltdown Man. That's probably one of the uh, oldest and most famous ones a lot of people are aware of. Uh, this is a, a picture of the New York Times uh, from Sunday, December 22nd, 1912. And if you'll notice on the edge here on the, on the left, you'll see where it says Darwin's theory is proved true. It says here, bones illustrate a stage of evolution which has only been imagined before. Well, uh, I've got some news for you, some updated news from, uh, you know, 2012. It's still only been imagined before and will continue to only be imagined in the future. So anyway, this is what they were claiming in 1912. Uh, Piltdown Man was even used as evidence for evolution in the Scopes Monkey Trial. Um, I would love to stop for a minute and talk about the Scopes Monkey Trial. Perhaps we should, you know, I don't think we've done a show on that before. Uh, we may want to do that eventually if we want to discuss the Scopes Monkey Trial and the movie Inherit the Wind. Um, it, there's a great article I wrote on that. Uh, well, you know, I think it's great, but <laughs> anyway, uh, Evolution Pleads the Fifth. At creationliberty.com, if you go to our article section, that's in there. Read that, and basically, if you watch the movie Inherit the Wind, you know, I might as well come back to the, uh, you know, if I'm going to talk about this for a minute, I might as well come back to the, uh, wait a second, where is it? Ah, here we go. 
Um, if you if you have ever watched the movie Inherit the Wind, if you will assume everything you see in the movie, assume the opposite about it, you will be right 95% of the time. That's how corrupt that movie is. Um, if they're showing that at your public school, you need to object to that movie. It's just, you know, it's, it's not educational whatsoever. That is a piece of propaganda they use to try to make evolutionists look smart and try to make Christians look dumb. Uh, when really, uh, if you look at the actual movie, it was extremely deceptive what the, the atheists and evolutionists did and some of the uh, acts of the ACLU, which is, uh, you know, I, in certain fundamentalist circles, it's more known as the American Communist Lawyers Union, uh, since Roger Baldwin, the guy that founded that, claimed that the entire goal was for communism. Uh, the goal of that organization was for the advancement of communism, and uh, though they may have done some good things, I mean, there are, I mean, there, uh, there's all sorts of, I mean, every branch of government, for example, has done good things. They could probably, I'm sure there's somewhere we could find good things that they've done, but there's also bad things that go along with it. So just because, you know, they say, well, the ACLU's done this and this and this. Okay, that might be true, but there's other bad things that they've done on top of that. Now, just because it doesn't make it into mainstream media doesn't mean they haven't done those things. So you have to really research it and find out. So anyway, if you if you check out, check out that article, that'll give you a whole bunch of details of some of the deception that was going on at that time and what really happened. So we'll continue on with this subject, uh, going back to where I was. Here we go. Okay. So, anyhow, uh, so Piltdown Man was used as evidence for evolution in the Scopes Monkey Trial. I, there were hundreds of people because Piltdown Man was taught for 40 years in the schools. So, for 40 years, hundreds of people wrote their, you know, uh, doctrinal thesis on the Piltdown Man, and the thing never happened. It, it, was, a, it was an entire hoax. Uh, in 1956, it was uh, revealed as a hoax as uh, somebody who was analyzing this found out that somebody took an orangutan jaw and put it on a human skull on purpose in order to fake and make it look more ape-like. So the whole thing, they taught this you know, for over 40 years, and the whole thing was not true at all. And it, it led so many people to believe in evolution, and they continued to believe in evolution after that. I mean, it, it's amazing how uh, this kind of stuff, it, it, for some reason, I don't know... It, the only thing I can say about this, and I guess, you know, I was probably going to save this for later, but I kind of want to mention it now, was that, look, creation, and I want to say this to all evolutionists as well, you need to understand something, because I guarantee you, most evolutionists don't understand this. I'm not saying all of them, but most of them don't understand this. Creation and evolution are both religious, okay? By definition, they're both religious. Neither can be proven scientifically, okay? The only difference between creation and evolution is that evolution is tax-supported. And there's a great quote I don't have pulled up here. Now, it, Thomas Jefferson, as an, an ungodly man as he was in some areas, had a wonderful quote. He said basically that, you know, anything that is a lie has to be tax-supported. The truth can stand by itself. So it's very interesting that creation has lasted all this time without tax support, but the evolutionists have to have tax support to fund their church. And so if we just get rid of the taxes, the whole thing will die away because, you know, everybody, <laughs> anybody with, a, you know, a sensible brain that's going to look at this is going to say, wow, there's some really serious problems with this. Why don't we just ditch the, the Swiss cheese theory? Mm -hmm. So anyhow, we'll, we'll move on here uh, to what we we're talking about. I just want to mention that on the side. Uh, now, Nebraska Man, now this one a lot of evolutionists will object to, me even bringing this up, but Nebraska Man is another one, and I'll show you why I bring this up. I was originally going to take this out of my seminar series, but when I looked up some information on this, there's a reason I kept it in here, and I'll show you. Uh, now, Henry Fairf Fairfield Osborne, director of the American Museum of Natural History in the 1920s, was delighted to confirm the discovery of supposedly pre-human fossil tooth by the paleontologist Harold Cook in his anti-fundamentalist newspaper, that means a newspaper that basically hates Christians and creationists and anything biblically related, uh, in his anti-fundamentalist newspaper articles and radio broadcasts. So this is definitely not a creationist resource, okay? Now, uh, this is a supposedly pre-human fossil tooth. A single tooth was found, okay? That's all they found. Now, this is a picture, that, what you're looking at right here is a picture of the Nebraska man that was drawn, this was illustrated for the London News in 1922. This, they made an entire man out of one tooth. And then, over here, they made the guy a wife. 
You have to be really good to know what his wife looks like based on his tooth, but these are professionals, so don't question them, okay? Until they found out that the tooth was from a pig. That's the real Nebraska man right there. So it's, you know, they jump, from the stories that you'll read, if you read up on this, this kind of issue, you'll see that, uh, you know, there were people that were warning, uh, there were some evolutionists who analyzed this, who warned these people, do not publish this stuff because you're headed for embarrassment. But they published it anyway, and so it was very quickly found out that it was from a pig. Okay, so it didn't it didn't go everywhere all over the world. But you can see how the the people that are against the Christians and against creationists will jump to anything they can possibly use for evidence for evolution. It doesn't matter if it's right for, right or wrong, as long as it convinces people evolution is true, they'll use it. So Neanderthal man, named after Joachim Neander. Joachim Neander is the one. There's a there's a hymnal in in your uh, songbooks in your uh, in some of your churches, those that have the psalm books, called Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. Uh, Joachim Neander wrote that song, and the valley uh, was named Neander Valley after him, and that's where they found the, found the Neanderthal man. So as, you know, typically Satan likes to use everything God that create, you know, creates and, and use it for his own purpose. That's what he does, because Satan's really, he's kind of more like a blood-sucking leech. He doesn't really create anything on his own. He takes everything God's already created and just corrupts it. So, anyway... Now, the first Neanderthal man was found in 1856 by some quarry workmen. Although the bones were obviously human, they looked a bit different. They were just a little bit different today. They were slightly bigger, you know. Um, like, for example, Neanderthal man, when they analyzed the bones of the Neanderthal man, and this is kind of interesting. Let me uh, talk to the camera again. Uh, this is a little bit interesting. The Neanderthal uh, skulls, were slightly bigger, their brain, their average brain size, they said, was uh, bigger than ours, and their muscle, because as you as you work a, a muscle, the bone gets bigger, because if you worked your muscles over and over, your muscles got bigger, but your bones remain the same size, eventually your bones are going to snap under the tension. So the bones have to grow as the muscles grow. So as judging from the bone size, the, the thickness and density of the bones that they had, for what density there was, we'll talk about that in a minute, about uh, rickets and things like that. But uh, from the bone density they had, they could have picked up the average NFL linebacker and thrown him over the goalpost. These guys were incredibly strong. Um, and so some of what uh, the pictures I'm going to show here, what they did, and I'll show you right here, uh, they got together nine different artists, okay, from this image right here that I, I have outlined in red. Nine different artists were given a Neanderthal skull, the same one, and they say, please tell us, you know, from, you know, your analysis of what this guy looked like. And they came back with nine different results, uh, comp all completely different. And basically, to the art, from the artist's perspective, and the next time my wife's on here, if you guys want to ask her, in, in, you know, on the show or something, she can tell you because, you know, she went to an art and design school. Um, basically, if you hand it to an artist, they'll say, well, what do you want it to look like? We can look at make it look a little more human-like, a little more ape-like, you know. Just tell us what you want it to look like, and we'll make it like that. So you can't really tell a whole lot from the skull. I mean, you can tell he had two eyes and a mouth, and you know, <laughs> there's a few other things, but you can't t tell too much more beyond that. Now, Rudolf Verkau, I think that's how you pronounce his name, Verkau. Rudolf Verkau, uh, who rec is recognized as the father of modern paleontology, go go look him up. You can just you know Google his name. He's recognized as the moder the father of modern paleontology. He said the bones that were found, the Neanderthal bones, uh, were a modern human that suffered from rickets and arthritis. Okay, now rickets is uh, basically you know where your bones get start to get weaker, um, and I've seen some people that are older, like for example, if you. Uh, I, you know, I used to have a piano teacher a long time ago. She was hunched over, you know, what you call a hunchback, where they're, you know, leaned way over, and their bone, basically, as your, if, when your bones soften, they're more easily, um, I guess, uh, bendable and adjustable, and they'll, they'll end up healing and growing back that way. So, basically, the softer your bones are, the, the less they can really support. So, it ended up causing a hunchback, so they're all hunched over like that. And so, what it's saying here is that Rudolph Rakow, who's considered the, um, the father of modern paleontology, is saying these are not people coming, going from a monkey to becoming a human. He says they're just really old, and they have rickets and arthritis, and they're slowly going down. They're not slowly coming up. They're slowly going down. And so, uh, but all the people, you know, all the uh, today's, you know, 
a bunch of today's evolutionary uh, paleontologists. I don't, you know, uh, the paleontology, I mean, a lot of paleontology anymore is just basically studying evolution. They're not really studying uh, bone structure as much as they used to. Uh, but basically, that's what, you know, he ended up uh, concluding from that. So, anyway... What I want to show you here is, uh, this is on my in a few of my different seminars, if you check this out. By the way, everything that you're seeing here, you can watch this on my seminar uh, number two for free on our website. Um, or just go back and replay this video. I'm just going through this at a slower pace and explaining some things I don't get a chance to in the seminar. But Methuselah was the oldest recorded man. Now, now people, uh, they always say, well, Methuselah was the oldest man in the Bible. He's the oldest recorded man. We don't know if he was the oldest one, but, you know, from the genealogy that's recorded here, he was the oldest living person. He lived to be uh, 969 years old. That's why if you go and uh, look at, you know, we talk about tree ring dating on the uh, the carbon dating uh, article I have on our website. I talk about Methuselah, which is named, it's, it's what they consider the oldest tree based on counting the rings. Uh, those rings are not annual rings. Uh, they can be in some cases, but they're not for this one. But they claim it's the oldest tree, and they called it Methuselah. Uh, anyway, you'll notice that um, before, uh, like Noah, for example, lived 950 years old, and you'll notice this. This um, you see this blue line in the middle. That's the flood. Okay, the date of the flood. After that, according to the genealogy, it they were living about 400 years old, then dropped down to about 200 years old. And they were dropping down to, they were living, some, most were living over 100 years old. It was going from 200, 150, down to 100. And today, very few people make it past 100 years old. So something had changed after the flood. And we talk a lot about that on seminar number two. I'm not going to go into a great detail about that um, because of the, we're staying on topic today. Now, of course, uh, Jacob, when he met Pharaoh, he told Pharaoh, he said, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. So he was 130 years old when he met Pharaoh. He said, Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers. So here is another place where he's verifying the genealogy and saying, Look, you know, I might be old to you guys, but my, my fathers were much older than me. Um, so, anyway, there's a great book you guys can get. I didn't bring it over um, here with me. Uh, I think it's still upstairs, but it's a book called Buried Alive uh, by Jack Cuazzo. I would have to, you know, leave and go upstairs and get it if I wanted to do that. Lorraine, do you want to go get it for me? Lorraine's sitting here in the room. She, you know, it's at, uh, you know what it looks like. It has the skull thing on the front. Yeah, okay. Uh, but after um, examining the famous Rhodesia man, or Broken Hill Hill man, that's what some people call it, uh, the, it's a Neanderthal skull, Dr. Kowazo said, you must understand that this skull really cries out disease. The teeth are badly decayed, and the bones of the vault of the skull are extremely thick, there are many features that testify of acromegaly or accession of, uh, of excuse me, ex excess secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. Now, we need to talk about what he means by that, you know, because, you know, some people mean, you know, they're like, you know, you said 50 things about that. Wow, I forgot to, I forgot to switch this over, didn't I? <laughs> I do that sometimes. I'm sorry about that. You guys have been staring at me the whole time, and I forgot to uh, point those out. I'll show you the picture of that real quick so you can see. Uh, basically, this is what he's talking about, this um, acromegaly. Did I switch that over again? Man, I am terrible at this. Hang on a second. There we go. Okay. I'm, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Here we go. All right. That's why I need a producer, man. It's so much easier <laughs> to have them switch this over. But uh, he says, uh, again, that it's of acromegaly. This is what he's talking about right here. Or excess, excess secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. And this is the book, Buried Alive, right here, uh, that Lorraine is going to go try to find for me in just a moment. So uh, let me bring it back here. And now what he's talking about, when you when he says, you know, of acromegaly and things like that, for example, your the brow ridge of your eye, if you guys put your finger up on your eyebrow and feel that, there's a bone right there. That is your eyebrow ridge, okay? You have them on both sides. That never stops growing your whole life. So, you know, whereas if you looked at someone who was, you know, 20 years old and someone who is 90 years old, you can tell a difference in their eyebrow ridge. Thank you, Lorraine. I appreciate that. And this is, uh, this is the book, Buried Alive, right here. He talks more about that. Um, but basically, he, um, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I don't make money from endorsing this, okay? It's nothing like that. I'm just saying this is a really good book. You can get it. You can, I got a real cheap copy on half.com. If you feel like you want to support our ministry, you can email us at sales at creationliberty.com. We can actually order this for you if you want to support our ministry and go through us. But if you don't have a whole lot of money to spend, but you really want to get the book and read it, go to half.com or something like that. I think I got this for like five bucks or something. <laughs> it's really cheap. So I tried to, uh, or maybe it wasn't this one. Maybe that was another one. I can't remember. 
but uh, some of the some of the books I can't find on places like that. You really have to go through a creation ministry because they're hard to get a hold of. And this, I don't know whether this one will be available to you or not. But anyway, point being is that your eyebrow ridge continually grows. Now, if you're going to live to be, you know, 200, 400 years old, you're going to have a really uh, distinguished eyebrow ridge, uh, much more so than you know someone who's really young. And you can tell the difference there. So, um, and basically, that's not the only thing that stops growing. There's lots of things that do. Um, your the tip of your nose, and like the um, the your earlobe, actually they continue to grow. I actually think we've explained that on a, on an earlier show when we were just we were covering this very very briefly. I only talked about this for a little bit, but basically, you know, you have um, and that's why you, you ever seen the old uh, cartoons, especially some of the Disney cartoons. They'll have this wicked witch, and she's got the long nose and the long ears, or something like that. Or you have an elderly guy that has that. That's because they don't stop growing. So that's why they portray them that way. Because when you get really old, you start looking like that. And if you, you know, go find somebody that's 100 years old. And I know it's hard to do, but, you know, 90, 100 years old and, and check that out. I mean, you're going to see, you're going to notice a real difference. So the point is, and let me go back to this uh, real quick, because we'll talk about Jack Kawazo again in just a moment. Uh, let me go back through this. Now, this is, uh, it, you can see here, this is a Neanderthal skull. And what I wanted to say about Jack Cuazzo real quick is that he got to go study the actual bones in France. He didn't just study a replica. Most, most evolutionists, uh, when they go and get their degrees, they study a replica. He got to go out there and study the actual bones and see this. But this is from a Neanderthal. The eyebrow ridge is very distinguished, okay? And according to Jack Cuazzo, these particular, this particular skull that had this eyebrow wedge, this is a person that would have lived to be about 200 years old. and that, So it would have been a, a post-flood person that was still getting smaller after the flood because they used to be, live to be, you know, we, they find uh, human skeletons 12 to 13 feet tall. If you want to learn more about that, just watch our seminar number two. You can watch it for free on the website. Just uh, click on the video section at creationliberty.com if you're watching this from YouTube or something. But this, uh, this textbook is talking about the Neanderthal skulls, okay? And you'll see right here it says, Neanderthals were distinguished by massive ridges over the eyes. So the distinguishing factor that the evolutionists are using when they analyze these skulls is the eyebrow ridge. But that is the distinguishing factor that shows that they were post-flood people living to be greater age than we do today. So basically what the evolutionist does, they, they see these skulls, they see the eyebrow ridge, and they say, wow, this person was living to be, you know, older than we are today. The evolutionist looks at the eyebrow ridge and they say, wow, this person evolved from a monkey five million years ago. If you can't see the, the lack of sense people are using when they look at this stuff, I mean, they are going to a huge extreme to say such a thing that we don't really have any evidence for. So, I mean, I'm, I'm showing a few different skulls here. These are different types of skulls. There's a European, an Aborigine, a flathead Indian. There's a lot of differences between these, but they're all obviously human. I mean, it's, it's obviously a human skull. You can tell the difference between them. There's certain factors and ways that you can do that. And um, if you ever want to get it, now I don't, I don't agree with everything that, uh, well, let me, let me talk to the camera again, I guess, uh, so you guys don't have to stare at that the whole time. The, uh, now what's his name? Um, Lorraine, help me out. What's the name of the guy? Um, works up at the, it works at the Creation Museum in uh, Cincinnati. David Minton, Dr. David Minton. Sorry, I couldn't remember his name. Uh, David Menton, uh, he was a, a medical professor. I can't remember if he was a medical professor or biologist. I'm sorry, biologist. And he was, I know he was taught school. He taught at a college at, uh, in Washington, I think. Um, I'd have to get his details again. I can't remember right off the top of my head. I've met him and talked with him probably, you know, five or six different times. I definitely don't agree with everything he teaches, okay? Um, and he is, uh, very hooked into a few things that, you know, I would say, wait a second. But he has some really good materials. Um, it has some good videos. And one of them uh, I would highly recommend to people is one called, um, I think it's Lucy, She's No Lady. And we're going to discuss Lucy in a minute. But he has a really good video on that where he shows how to tell the difference between, there, there are four main factors in telling the difference between a human skull and an ape skull. So um, either look that up and see if you can find it. Somebody might have it for free on YouTube. I don't know. But he's got some DVDs. Um, I'm, I'm sure you can get that through Answers in Genesis or you know someplace else if you try to look for it. I, I can't get that for you. I don't have it available. So um, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll continue here. Uh, let me see if I can get this uh, move past this point. Okay. Now what you're looking at here from the book Buried Alive, this is a photograph of what in now this is um, 
a book that Jack Cuazzo, Dr. Jack Cuazzo was given this by a mentor of his. It was an a old professor of his, a friend of his, it's a mentor, gave him, he said, this is the book. And I forget when they did this. I can't remember if it was like uh, seven, uh, 1979 or something like that uh, is the year he did this. At the time, this was the top book in the world on Neanderthals. He said, this is what we use in all the professional colleges and everything else. When people are analyzing these skulls, this has all the documentation, drawings, and illustrations of these skulls. So this is what what it showed as, and this is the particular skull um, of the, was it Pec de la Aze or something like that? I don't know. Somebody who speaks French or, you know, is going <laughs> to get on to me for uh, uh, mispronouncing it. But this particular skull, it's supposed to be a child's skull, actually. And this one that they um, showed, you're going to notice, it, well, let me just get to the point. This is how they show it in the book. Here is what happened after he got this into a, uh, a frame in order to take x-rays of it. Uh, because he, he got the world's first portable x-ray machine to take over there to analyze these skulls. Now, what happens is that the way you're going to see it over here, this one I'm circling, this is the way it was shown in the display case when he took it out. Notice right here the jaw separation. This is the way it's at the display case. But he, but Dr. Kawazo is a dentist, primarily, okay? And what he did is set the teeth on a skull set into each other in a, in a particular way. He set the teeth in. He did it five times in a row just to make sure he had it right. And when he set the teeth in place, the jaw, you'll notice right here, locked in place where it should be on a normal human, human skull. You see how what they did in the display case is pop the jaw out to make it look more ape-like. They're lying to people and deceiving people to make them think this is the ancestor of humans. This is, I mean, this becomes evidence for evolution. This is a normal human skull, okay, in every sense of the word. Now, this is uh, um, from World Net Daily. This is in 2005. A flamboyant anthropologist professor, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this, I guess I should say first, the reason what I'm going to read to you here is that they have been lying about these Neanderthal skulls for a long time, and it's still happening today. A flamboyant anthropology professor who wor whose uh, work had been cited as evidence Neanderthal man once lived in northern Europe has resigned after a German university panel ruled he fabricated data. He lied for 30 years about the age of human skulls dating them tens of thousands of years old even though they were much younger. So they're still, they're still catching people lying about these Neanderthal skulls because they're so desperate for evidence for evolution that this becomes evidence for evolution. So the other, another one we'll talk about is Cro-Magnon Man. I'm only going to mention this briefly because basically they just say it's a more modern version of human. It's just the, the next step between monkey, you know, this um, basically Neanderthal and human, this is the step between it. But it's so obviously a human. If you took one of these full skeletons, I mean, give him his body back, put a suit and tie on the guy and walk him down the street, nobody's going to look twice. I mean, I don't know if, you know, depending if we have uh, the sizes, if you could fit, you know, a khaki's in a polo on this guy, but, you know, nobody's even going to notice. It's so obviously a human, but they keep calling it a missing link because they have to have something as evidence for evolution. And so they go through and they find, I mean, this is another example I give just to show where there are gaps even in this tiny hole. Uh, in 1973, South African geologist, uh, this part, a guy named Partridge, dropped a bomb. His investigations revealed that a cave from which the Tong, uh, this is Africanus, this is the one I have circled up here, the Africanus skull, had, co uh, had come could not have formed prior to 0.87 million years ago. Well, that means there's the 0.87 million. Here's where Africanus is supposed to be, and that gives you a large gap of about 3 million years that they don't have accounted for. I mean, and so the thing is, this guy, I mean, from what I read from him, this guy was fired immediately and kicked out, I mean, because you cannot discover anything that goes against their preconceived evolutionary geologic column. It, it is the Bible of the evolutionists. It is holy and sacred to them, and you cannot defy that, or basically uh, you're thrown out, or your research is you know, thrown out, or you're heckled out of the, out of the you know, system, whatever they have set up. So what we're going to discuss next is Lucy, which is an afarensis. This one right here, see, this is Africanus afarensis. I forget what afarensis means. I used to know. Eh, look that up online. I'm sure you can find it. Um, but this is... Um, What's Lucy supposed to be back here that started, you know, between three and six million years ago? Uh, and this is the Lucy skeletal display. Um, these are the bones that were claimed to have been found. Uh, now, first of all, I want to read you um, something that was written by a guy named Jeff Lewis. He is a, an open 
are an ev evolutionist and atheist. He is very open about those things. He has a he has a blog site where he writes in his little journal and his blog called Jeff's Lunch Break. And he wrote a blog which he entitled The Review of Lucy's Legacy Exhibit at the Houston Museum of Natural Science. This was back in 2007 when they had it on display there. Here's what he said. And I'm sorry I read it like this, but I can't help but read it like this. Here we go. He said, Lucy was the main reason we drove six hours to go to Houston. Seeing them, he's talking about the bones, in person doesn't teach you much, but there's just something magical about it. I stood and stared at her for as long as my family would let me and had butterflies in my stomach the whole time. To look down at that little three-foot, eight-inch skeleton, knowing how long ago she lived and how closely related we are to her, no words can do justice to the feeling you get. Folks, he's claiming right here he had a religious experience going to see a bunch of monkey bones. I, <laughs> I just, I tell the evolutionists, it is a religion, okay? I don't care how much you want to believe that it's not a religion. It's a religion by definition. And, and Jeff, uh, Jeff Lewis is not the only one that gets these religious experiences over evolution. So, Donald Johansson discovered Lucy. Uh, I, I use that term kind of loosely because, and I'll, well, I'll tell you why in just a moment. But anyway, he's, this is, uh, the site was in Ethiopia in 1974. He, he discovered Lucy. Now, keep in mind, Donald Johansson had gone to Africa on a grant with the purpose of finding missing links. He wanted to find something. Now, the funny thing is, now, look, I don't know whether, um, I'll give you an example. I don't know if Bigfoot exists or not. Now, I'm probably already going to get heckled uh, by some evolutionists. So he's like, ha ha, see, he's so dumb, he thinks that Bigfoot exists. No, I didn't say that. I said, I don't know if Bigfoot exists or not. I'm probably on uh, lean towards the side to say he it probably doesn't exist, but I am open to listening people and to, and to take testimonies on this kind of thing. I just have to say I don't know because there's been some honest Christian people that said I have seen one, so I don't know. Uh, however, if somebody goes out, uh, you know, into the wilderness looking for Bigfoot, and they find Bigfoot, it's people are typically really skeptical. Now, if you were to discover Bigfoot by accident, that would be a little more believable. Now, you're going to investigate both of the claims no matter what, but it's more believable when, when you find it by accident, when you weren't looking for it, and you found it. But when somebody goes out looking for a missing link, and they find it, immediately you're skeptical. Now, if you'll be skeptical with somebody who does that with, you know, I don't care if it's the Loch Ness Monster, or it's Bigfoot, or anything like that, but you won't be skeptical when somebody goes and looks for a missing link, especially when they're on a grant, and they have a vested interest in finding a missing link, and then they claim they found one. If you're not going to be at least a little skeptical, uh, skeptical about that, then you're a hypocrite, okay? You need to be consistent on all things like this. So anyway, let's go back to this, uh, so we can finish this up here, and then I'll, I'll take some questions in just a moment from... Uh, from the chat room. So, um, but two weeks before his grant money ran out, he found Lucy. Now, that's awfully coincidental. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but, you know, you, we ought to be a little skeptical of this one. Now, this is the, now, these are the bones, but here is the typical skull that is shown in the textbooks. This is a picture of the typical Lucy skull. Can you explain to me how you get from this to this? I don't, how do you take a few bone fragments and complete an entire skull, okay? And of course the evolutionists are going to say, well, well, we have all these scientific ways, but you ignorant people don't know anything about it. You know, I get those kind of comments on YouTube all the time. Look, I don't care what science degree you have. I'm saying you cannot get all this information from this skull. You don't know exactly what that thing looked like. Now, the knee I'm showing you here is claimed as Lucy's knee, but is it, this is not Lucy's knee, okay? National Geographic called it Lucy's knee five times, and Donald Johansson allowed them to do that. He only didn't, you know, when somebody pointed out, wait a second, that's not Lucy's knee, then he suddenly retracted it. I don't know why he allowed them to call it that five times in their November 1985 issue, but he certainly did. It seemed like he didn't want to say anything about it. Um, but the knee, uh, that was during the interview when they when they had this. They, I think they have a, I forget how many pages they dedicated to that one. You can check out that issue and find out. But this was the, the knee that was shown here was found a year earlier and 70 meters lower and over a mile away from the site where he found the rest of the bones. If that was Lucy's knee, I want to see the, you know, the, the train that hit the chimpanzee that knocked that knee a mile away, okay? So, anyway, they have, now, why is this claimed as Lucy's knee, and why is this claimed as a missing link? Well, man's knee, or man's femur, excuse me, the femur is angled, uh, Lucy's femur was angled, but an ape's femur is straight. So they say, see, this is slowly becoming from ape to a human. 
Well, this is, I'm sorry to say it so direct, but this is a stupid argument, okay? All tree climbing monkeys have an angled femur so they can tightrope walk. And apes don't because they walk on the ground and they have to shift their weight back and forth. They can't tightrope walk like you and I can. So we can tightrope walk and walk over a, you know, a thin space and so can they. And they're designed with that purpose. Duh. Okay. Now, some of their other arguments, they'll say, well, Lucy's uh, knee was slightly bigger than a regular ape's knee. And that's what Donald Johansson said in his book describing Lucy. Okay, well, the bones of a Clydesdale are slightly bigger than a regular horse. So I guess by evolutionary logic, that proves that the horse is becoming a truck. I mean, it, <laughs> this is not an argument whatsoever. So, uh, for many years, and this is from the Houston International Festival, this is when they had Lucy out there. For many years, Lucy was thought to be a direct human ancestor, but we now see her as belonging to a separate group of hominids from those which became our species. So now Jeff Lewis on his website said, oh, this was our ancestor long ago, but the Houston International Festival that was holding Lucy there said, this is not the same as humans. It's not a direct ancestor. But here is what's so ludicrous about this. Listen to this. Later on in this same article that they wrote, they said, for 20 years, Lucy was thought to be the oldest human-like fossil ever found. And as we just saw, they said, it's not anymore. It's not part of, of, of the human ancestry according to evolution. But watch this. Lucy remains the benchmark by which all other discoveries are judged to discover more about the progress of mankind. How... What? <laughs> I just... How can... I have to laugh at this. How can you... Okay, Lucy is not a missing link of humans. But she remains the benchmark to discover the missing link of humans. If, look, if you're not laughing right now, I, I don't think... <laughs> I think you're taking this evolution thing way too seriously, okay? Because they, there's all sorts of contradictions like this uh, that are found. And I'm going to uh, scan through here and see if there's anything more. Oh, yeah, I want to show you guys this. This is uh, really, really bad, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. This is the um, St. Louis display. They put, and, and you'll notice, if you look at the, at, at the Lucy, Lucy Bones, let me back up here and show you. I, I want you to notice something. Uh, here we go. I went too far. This is, the, this is the skeleton, okay? Notice there are no feet or hand bones that were found. All right, now I want to go forward. Let me go back to where I was just a second ago. I want you, do you notice the problem here? Notice how they put feet and toes, and they put five toes like a human, and then in this display, there's human footprints, and they put a slight toe separation in order to make it seem like it's a transitioning from an ape to a human. This is flat-out deception. This is a flat-out lie. They are lying to kids coming through their zoo, okay? This purpose of this display is not to educate, it is to indoctrinate, okay? Now, David Minton, who I mentioned earlier, he says this statue is a complete misrepresentation. He says, I believe they know it is a misrepresentation. You can go to the Creation Museum in uh, Cincinnati, and he has little seminars he gives. I think it's like $4 to attend one of those. They charge for those, uh, and so... And people say, they charge for that? Yeah, well, you might be used to me because I don't charge for mine, but they charge for theirs. But, you know, for some of his stuff that they have in there, especially for the microscarium, oh, man, if you go to that, it's so cool. I should be talking on the camera for this one. It's so neat. They, they uh, let you see, uh, they have one of the really powerful microscopes on an HD screen in there. It's really neat. You can watch that stuff. So it's worth the four bucks. <laughs> go in and pay for it and learn some cool things. But, you know, you can go in and ask him and verify this quote for, uh, for yourself if you want. Because, remember, you're supposed to prove all things. You're not supposed to take my word for it. And uh, this is Bruce Carr. He's the St. Louis Zoo's director of education. Now, he says, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. Now, that's supposed to be, I think that was, I don't know if he intended that to be a joke or not, because they, they call them knuckle walkers. So, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. He says, we look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct. Folks, let me translate for you what he is trying to tell you. We want these kids to believe in evolution when they come through our zoo. So even if this is not true, it doesn't matter because it will help them believe in evolution. <laughs> I just, wow. Wow. There's nothing more you can say to that. Is that it doesn't matter. You know, he, we don't want to teach the truth. We just want to lie to them so they'll believe in evolution. And folks, this is the problem that we have in our public school system and in zoos and museums. We have the same problem over and over. And lastly, 
you know, I'll, I'm going to um, show you this uh, a couple couple more slides here. Arranging things in order. Now they have arrangements uh, like this. And I'm going to show you this real quick. Let me uh, switch the screen back over. I'm going to show you this. this. This is the kind of thing that they'll show. Arranging things in order like this. Arranging things in order doesn't prove anything. I show people all the time the evolution of silverware. I think that knife slowly evolved grooves over millions of years of geologic pressure. Uh, slow, you know, formed this uh, depression in it and forming spoons, and then there were grooves formed in it later and f formed, you know, like short tying forks and things like that. But you know what? In this evolution of silverware, it just seems like there's a missing link. But, it, you know, I found that if you go into Kentucky Fried Chicken, the cashier will hand you the missing link. A lot of times they don't really know what they've got. And so uh, they handed me the missing link, and here it is, the spork. We have the missing link to the evolution of silverware, you know. And so arranging things in order doesn't prove anything, okay? It doesn't prove any evolutionary relationship. But the only missing link I have found is modern man because there is something missing between his ears because he thinks he came from a monkey, okay? It's ridiculous. Now, this Discover magazine says, where are we going? Well, I'll tell you where you're going. You're going straight to hell if you don't accept Christ. So I would get rid of this dumb religion of evolution and get onto the Bible and get your get your heart right with Christ and start learning the truth. That would be you know the solution to the whole thing. So anyway, that's all we're going to discuss for tonight on on uh, the uh, eight you know uh, monkey to man model that they have. They don't have any evidence for this kind of stuff, okay? But it seems really convincing in the textbooks. I mean, when they read it, they say, "Oh, see, we have this evidence. Look, look at these. You know, this monkey and then this one and this one and then they they say, well, this human and this human and see how." They arrange each other. I mean, we get into our seminar five. They did the exact same thing, and they they took um, they would uh, kill Aborigines in Australia, boil down their skulls, and pack them and send them off to overseas as evidence for evolution. Uh, they captured live um, uh, Africans, brought them back, and stuck them in cages. And this was in the St. Louis Zoo. I mean, at the World's Fair, they did this about a hundred years ago. They would stick them in a cage with chimpanzees and say, "Oh, look how look. This is evidence for evolution. Look at these uh, poor." You know, humans, they just haven't evolved enough yet. You know, they did this stuff over and over. And then the evolutionists, when you bring this up, they try to classify it as social evolution, as if this does not teach a philosophy. I've had so many people try to tell me that evolution doesn't teach a philosophy. What do you think they did this for? They, it, evolution justified racism. It's, it teaches a philosophy, folks. If you don't want to believe that it does, you are welcome to your belief. But it does, no matter what you want to believe, okay? So let me check the chat room. I actually haven't really checked it the entire time I've been talking. I'm sorry, I've been talking a bunch. Let's see who we got uh, joining us today. We have some guests who haven't logged in. Uh, if you ever, if you guys got confused on how to log in, uh, you just, you know, there's instructions at the bottom of the page. If you go to creationliberty.com and type in, uh, uh, or just go to the, um, the link podcast on there, and that'll take you down um, so you can see that. Do I have my screen up properly? Yes, I want to double check on that. So, um, Let's see here. We got Clark is in here joining us, and Tanya's joining us today. Hi guys, thanks for coming in. And uh, let me see. I'm looking as we have any questions. Um, exercise for osteoporosis. That's that's a good point. And a lot of people, you know, they get that because they don't keep exercising. That's why a lot of people who have, you know, certain when they get older, they have hip problems or things like that. There's actually a lot of horse therapy that's going on. Have them ride horses because it helps work those things out. The more active you, you, the more you stay active, the less your muscles and bones and stuff are going to lock up over the years, so it's good to stay active. Um, and again, you, if you guys want Lorraine to come back and talk about health stuff, you just ask the questions and I'll have her back on the show to talk about more health stuff, okay, because she's pretty good on that. She's my health expert. So, um, yeah, and I didn't get a chance to talk about, uh, Tanya made a good point that Jack Huaza almost, uh, him and his family almost got killed trying to get out of France with the information about the Neanderthals. They were hunted, um, and they, they had to go into hiding for a few days before they could get out of the country, and uh, there's a long story about that. Read the first few chapters of his book, and he'll talk about that, and uh, it's, it's very interesting how they escaped. The whole, the whole trip they made was actually, um, God was with them the whole time. It's amazing how they got in and out of there. It's a great story. And he'll talk about that, and he's had some friends murdered over this issue, and uh, he'll talk about that kind of thing. But um, anyway, uh, I'm looking for... Uh, someone said that, uh, was asking who taught people about fire. Um, well, basically, the way I see it, I mean, you don't really have to learn fire. I mean, the, the technical thing... See, the problem with that would be... 
it might get in too long of an answer. Because we could say, I mean, I would assume, just because, well, here's the reason I'm assuming this. Well, there's got to be fire when God asks for sacrifices. Yeah, but there weren't sacrifices until, um, yeah, it was after the fall that there were sacrifices made. Um, but really, the laws for sacrifices wasn't even until after the flood. And uh, the thing is, the reason I say that fire would have been taught to Adam, because if you look at the genealogy, there was somebody in the Bible named Tubal Cain, who was an, it was an artist, artif artificer, which means a teacher, of brass and iron. He worked with those things. He was a teacher of how to work with those things. And in order to work with brass and iron, you need to be able to heat, up, heat them up. So uh, they would have had to have had fire. And so, um, from my perspective, I would assume that God had taught Adam how to do that, how to make fire in all sorts of different ways. Perhaps they had different ways than we even have today. I have no idea, because the pre-flood world was quite different from what we have today. So, I don't know. I mean, when you come pre-programmed from the hand of God, and at the same time, God is there walking and talking with Adam for over 100 years while they're in the Garden of Eden, uh, you can learn all sorts of things. So, I mean, the thing is, I think they've always had fire. So, the knowledge of... Um, Learning how to make fire, I would say, comes from our Lord, that he taught them how to do that, and that's been passed down from generation to generation since. So, um, but it came, the use of fire became a lot more um, needed after the flood, because that's when you're going to have all sorts of weather changes, and we discover, we discuss reasons for that on our seminar too, which again, you can watch for free on our website, and, uh, and I think a lot of the, um, the use for fire and the need for fire was more predominant after uh, the flood. Which is why it seemed, you know, perhaps that, you know, there's all sorts of, um, you know, the cavemen issue of having start fire in caves. I mean, there were cavemen for a while because it's so much easier to live in a cave. There's cavemen today. A lot of people over, especially over in the Middle East, will live in a cave because it's so much easier. You don't have to build a house. And then, it's, I mean, if you build a house, you have to make sure it's on rock and not on sand. And so a cave system is automatically heated and cooled, depending on the time of the year, but basically over there it's mostly going to need to be cooled. But it has its own air conditioning system built into the earth, and you don't have to build anything. I mean, a cave is really convenient, so a lot of them still live in caves today over there. Um, and so there aren't any cavemen, unless you're talking about people like Osama bin Laden, but, you know, there are people who live in caves today, and that kind of thing. So... Anyhow, I think, uh, yeah, we've been going on for quite a while. I think I need to wrap this up because I have i didn't realize how long I was going. I didn't get a chance to talk about everything I wanted to, but we got the mo we got most of it on there, so uh, that'll do it for today. So anyway, I appreciate everybody joining us who did. Those of you who didn't log in, uh, just check the website next time. That'll show you how to log in if you got a little confused. And uh, next week, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do, but I'm possibly going to invite... Uh, Tanya on here was, uh, she's, her and I were going to talk about vaccines next week. So uh, there's a lot of people that, you know, really get irritated every time I talk about vaccines. I'm sorry if you're irritated. I just think it's an issue worth talking about. And I do believe that you ought to really research both sides of the issue before you get your kids vaccinated, okay? I'm not a medical professional, and next week we are not handing out uh, professional medical advice, okay? But we're just going to give you some information uh, from the other side of the topic. You see mainstream media all day. We're going to give you some issues on the other side of the topic that you can discuss um, and research and find out what is best for the health of you and your family. Uh, we just want to, we don't want people to have injuries that have come from vaccines. And, uh, you know, whatever you decide to do, that is up to you. Um, and as you are the, you, you know, whether you and your spouse, uh, your husband in particular is the leader of the household, but you as a mother are also you know, you have to make decisions for the health of your children, and we want to help you uh, in any way that we can. So anyway, we'll, we'll look forward to that next week, and next week will be show number 19, uh, and we'll be doing it on December 19th. So join us again at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time for that, and uh, until then, we'll see you guys next time. So thanks for joining us.